Good morning. Welcome. I know I hate interrupting conversations, but <laughs> I'll get over it. Just want to welcome you this morning and uh, those who are here and those who are joining us online. We appreciate uh, you taking the time to be with us today. And our prayer is that you will be challenged, but also encouraged as we meet together, sing together, and uh, just hear the word together. Announcements are in your bulletin. Read them, please. I do encourage you to do that. Uh, there is a prayer focus and there are a number of individuals and items on that list that you may want to, uh, to focus on this week as you do your prayer time. And uh, as I say, the rest are there for your perusal. The psalmist says in Psalm 147 verse one, he says, praise the Lord. How good it is to sing praises to our God. How pleasant and fitting to praise him. So let's stand if you are able and we'll sing hymn number 772. 772. You may be seated. Good morning. It's good to have you all with us this morning. Whether you are here or again, whether you are online, uh, it's good to have some guests with us this morning. Special welcome to you guys uh, and you guys and you guys. Um, over here is our friends from uh, Fairhaven Bible Camp. Sue and Perry Camo, and they live in Lenoxville, Quebec, and they are making their way to Prince Iward Peninsula. The only island now is Cape Breton, right? Because our bridge goes up and down, and their bridge doesn't, so you guys are a fixed link now, right? So there's no such thing as the island being PEI anymore. 
and I tease all my PEI friends about that all the time. So it's good to have you guys with us and enjoy your time over on the peninsula. Let's go to prayer, shall we? We have much to pray for. We have much to be thankful for. Father in heaven, again, we do thank you that you are an awesome God. And we thank you for all your attributes. You are almighty. You are all-knowing. You are ever-present. You are peace. You are joy. You are love. You are forgiveness. You are grace and mercy. You're holy. You're perfect and just. And Lord, we just thank you for who you are. And because of who you are, we are in awe of you this morning. Lord, we want to worship you. We want to magnify you and glorify you and you alone. We thank you for what you do for us each and every day. Thank you for your blessings, your provision, your protection, things that we often take for granted. We just want to say thank you. We thank you that we have your word in our hands that we can study, that we can meditate, that we can delight in. Help us to do that on a daily basis. Thank you that we have access to you. You tell us in your word, <coughs> excuse me, that we can come boldly before your throne of grace in the time of need. And that access is provided through Jesus Christ and what he has done on the cross. So we thank you for sending your only begotten son to come to this earth to live here, but ultimately to die here, to be buried and rise again. So we thank you for the wonderful work of the cross. Thank you for the forgiveness of sin that is made available to each and every one of us. And Lord, we thank you for this wonderful facility that you have blessed us with, where we could come and gather together and fellowship with one another, and we could worship you together. Help us to be an encouragement to each other today. Help us to be there for those who are struggling. Help us to be there for those who may be grieving. Help us to be there for those who are rejoicing. So, Lord, just help us to be there for one another. And, Lord, we ask that you would provide all of our needs as you tell us in your word. And it doesn't only mean financial needs. Some have those. We just pray that you will supply for them. But others have spiritual needs and physical needs and emotional and mental needs. Lord, we just pray that you would just meet us where we are and supply whatever need that we have. And, Lord, on our list... There are many who have different health problems. We bring them before you this morning and ask that you would touch their bodies. You would strengthen them where they need to be strengthened. You would restore them to their physical health so they could come and be with us and do the things that they need to do and the things that they enjoy doing. We think of our family and friends at the Drew. We think of our brother and sister, Elwin and Anne Marie. We thank you so much for them, for their faithfulness to you, to this church, to their families over the years. And Lord, we just ask that you would bless them, encourage them, keep them strong and healthy and free from accidents. And Lord, may they remember the things that they know about you. Lord, we also think of Weldon as well. We pray for him. Lord, we just pray that you would just, just speak to him in a personal way and that his heart would be open to the gospel. And Lord, we pray for my dad as well, that you would just bless him, encourage him. Again, help him to recall things that he knows about you. Lord, I thank you for his faithful example to us as a family over the years of what it means to be a man of God and a child of God. So bless the staff in our nursing homes in this area. Keep them healthy and strong. Encourage them. Lord, just watch over them, and we thank you so much for them. We think of those who are mourning the loss of loved ones today. Lord, I think of our sister Sheena who watches from Quebec faithfully. Um, her and her children lost her husband and their father this past week. Um, so we do pray for them, that you would strengthen them, you would encourage them. They would feel your presence and your love amongst themselves right now. So we pray for them. Again, we're, look, we're, we're praying for churches who are looking for pastors. That list seems to be growing longer each and every day. But Lord, we think of those churches in our area who are in need of pastors. We just pray for them. We think of Wood Point this morning. Lord, we just pray, pray that you would be preparing a man of God to fill the pulpit there, to minister to that flock and to the, to the community there where they can serve together. 
thank you for Pastor Morris as he fills in faithfully each and every week. Lord, we thank you for all the men that fill in the gaps in these churches that don't have pastors at this time. Just bless them and encourage them. And Lord, I pray for churches today who are preaching your word, who are open, who are opening the word of truth and proclaiming it freely. Um, just bless them and bless us as we do that today. So Father, we are so thankful for all that you do for us. There's so many other things on our list. You know what they are. We bring them all before you this morning. We thank you for being a great, awesome God. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Turn with me in your Bible to our scripture reading this morning, which is Hebrews chapter 11, and we'll start at verse 32. So Hebrews chapter 11, starting at verse 32. <clears throat> what sh what, and what shall I more say? For the time would fall me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jethu, of David also and Samuel and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant, er, valiant in fight, turned to flight, er, flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mocking and scourging, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword, they wandered about in sheepskin and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. I'm going to ask Betty Lynn to come and join me as we sing this morning.
let's take a few moments and greet the family in love. You can go around and shake and hug. If you don't want your hands shaken or hugged, just stick out your elbow and we will elbow hug you. Isn't that my job? <laughs> Pastor Paul said, I'm raining you guys in this morning. So let's get rained in. Well, before we sing one more hymn, let's just look to the Lord in prayer, please. Father God, we just want to thank you for this day. Thank you for the beautiful sunshine that we can enjoy and just to be able to see the beauty of your creation. Father, you are so good to us. You provide our needs. You look after us. You send your spirit into our lives to guide us, to give us peace, to give us encouragement and comfort and so many things. And we thank you for that. Thank you for providing for all of our needs, Father, for our needs as, as a church body, but also our needs individually. And uh, you have been, again, so good, and we praise you for that. And Father, as we continue in our worship this morning, we just want to ask that you would continue to guide us and lead us. Uh, speak to us through your spirit today as Pastor Paul speaks. And uh, we just pray that whatever is said and done as we continue this morning, we'll bring honor and glory to your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hymn number 774, please. 774, stand if you are able. And the roll is called up yonder.
so much. You may be seated. It is good to be back home, but it was good to be away. And thank you for praying for us as we were at Fairhaven Bible Camp this past week. And since you guys were involved with everything that took place this week, this week I will give you an update of what has taken place. Um, it was a great week when we got there. Uh, on our way there, this really has nothing to do, I just like to gripe and complain about this. Um, we decided when we got to Bathurst, it's time to stop for lunch. And Betty Lynn wanted her McDonald's stuff, and I'm not a McDonald's fan. Uh, so I'm like, I love the chicken tenders, the chicken strips from KFC. So I'm going to have some of those. And I went into the store, and I asked the guy for some, and he said, how many do you want? And I'm thinking, well, I'll probably eat a couple now, and then save some for after chapel at uh, camp, and make a little sandwich out of a chicken tender thing. So I said to the guy, I don't know, give me six or eight. So he gave me eight. And then he gave me the bill, and I almost fell on the floor. Eight chicken tenders, chicken strips, $27. Me, just thinking, I like these and I want to have them, didn't say no thank you and walk out of the store. I paid for them. And I'm like, oh, what did I do that for? But they were pretty decent. Anyway, we got to camp. And there was 15 boys, ages 10 to 12. And it was a fantastic week. Um, one fellow that was there, <clears throat> it was the first time I spoke at camp. And this young fellow had severe autism. I've never spoken at camp where a child with autism was there, and it was just exciting. And I didn't think he was going to make it past Sunday, because when we were doing things, he would be over on the swing by himself um, in his pajamas and stuff like that. When chapel started, he stayed out on the swing and didn't want to come in, and then all of a sudden he was gone. He went home, and I'm like, okay, he's not coming back. To my surprise, he was there Monday morning for breakfast, still in his pajamas, still doing his own thing, but he came to chapel on Monday night. He had his headset on because it was noisy. Um, if you were ever at a Bible camp, you know chapel times can be a little noisy at the beginning, um, but he was there, and he was there every chapel except for, I think, Friday morning. And then some of the campers were saying, it's not fair that he's in our cabin because we're not going to get all the points we can because he won't be able to say his verses. And I'm like, don't you worry about him, just worry about you and the verses you say. And this young fellow learned three verses this past week. Modified, of course. And the first verse that he learned, and I believe will remember the rest of his life because it's in his head and he knows it now, is for God so loved the world and he gave his only son. I said, that's all you have to say. And then another verse that he learned was John 14, 6. He knows that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Just that short section. And then Friday... Before I had a chance to say, hey, are you going to learn some of your verse today? He comes up to me all excited. I know my verse, I know my verse, I know my verse. And he started saying he got wrong, which was fine. I gave him a little bit of help. And he tried again, he tried again, he tried again. He took his paper and crumbled it up and threw it on the ground and left. And then he came back and picked it up and read it and tried it again. And Friday he said the whole verse. Friday, he said, Acts 17.30, which says, And he commands everyone everywhere to repent of their sin and turn to him. So this young fellow knows these three verses. And I'm pretty sure he obtained a lot that was going on in chapel. On Sunday evening, we spoke on 2 Timothy 3.16. 
All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable for certain things. And most of these boys have never heard the word scripture before. I said, what are the scriptures? Uh, they just didn't have a clue. So every morning this week, we focused on John 3.16. We looked at four spiritual truths from John 3.16. And if we know those truths, it will help us understand the rest of the Bible. So we spent all mornings looking at that, how God had a purpose. And that purpose was to have a personal relationship with all of us. But we have a problem. And that problem was sin. But God had a remedy for that problem. And that was his son Jesus. And whoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. In the evenings we looked at two words all week. Grace and mercy. They know what mercy and grace is off the top of their head. They, they could tell you. So we spent a couple of nights looking at those two words, and then we looked at a couple of examples through the Bible where God showed grace and mercy to those who asked. Um, so it was a great week. And on Thursday morning, <clears throat> I've invited the boys to make a decision. It's time for a decision, because sometimes we'll share the gospel and never get to the point of saying, okay, now you need to make a decision. So we talked about what decision need to be made, how to make it. And I said, you know, it's not the words that you say. It's just a sincere heart that God wants. And, you know, you can just cry to him and thank him for loving you. And admit to him that you're a sinner because we all are. And ask him to forgive us for our sin, and he will. And I don't like to point out names and stuff, so I said, with everyone's eyes closed, if you prayed that or asked God to forgive you, just put up your hand. Five or six boys put up their hand, and then I said, now I want you to tell someone. All right? I want you to come and tell me so I can pray for you or tell your counselor. Two people came up to me, so I know at least two people got saved this, la this last week, so thank you for your prayers because that's what it's all about. And one of those people that got saved was a counselor, which was totally exciting to me. Right, Because I always said, I believe counselors should be saved, should be living for the Lord. Junior counselors, kitchen staff, that's a different thing. right? So this young man put his faith and trust in the Lord. And then for the rest of the two days, every time I seen him, can you answer this question for me? Can you answer that question for me? Can you answer this question? So I was answering questions the last day and a half, two days. Um, so God was great this past week. So thank you for your prayers. Um, pray for these, <coughs> excuse me, two young men. Uh, the counselor's name was Josh, and the young fellow's name was Jaden. And uh, just pray for them. Uh, pray for the camp this week. This is their last week of the summer. They have, I believe, it's 42 teenagers, um, which is the biggest camp, I believe, ever, right? Um, Perry used to speak at teen camp, so he would know numbers more than I would. Uh, but I think it's the biggest camp ever. There's going to be campers sleeping on the floor in the chapel. There's going to be campers everywhere. It's probably in the lighthouse and up in trees and um, where they can pray for the staff. They're short on staff this week. Um, so there's different people from the area who are going to come in and give a hand doing dishes and cleaning and all that sort of stuff. And uh, the speaker this week, um, Danny Duga, a fantastic speaker. First week at camp ever. So pray for him as he ministers to 42 uh, teenagers between the ages of 13 and 18. And what I understand is their, the attendance is three boys to one girl. So there's more boys this year um, than girls. So uh, it's going to be a rough, tough week with all these big boys with sports because teen camp, they take sports seriously. And uh, they even have a draft for teams, instead of just picking cabin versus cabin, uh, the counselors sit on Monday morning and they draft all these players for their team. So it's quite the process. Uh, so pray for camp this week. Pray for Danny as he preaches the word and that um, they'll just feel the Holy Spirit's presence at camp this week. Let's get to the word, shall we? Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11 
And Lord willing, we're going to finish this chapter up this morning because we've been in it for quite a long time. Um, I think this is week 10 or 11 in chapter 11. So we're going to finish this up. And uh, I entitled this message this morning, What More Do You Want Me to Say? And maybe you're here this morning or listening online and you're thinking, I think you said enough. So just wrap it up and we can go home. Well, guess what? It wasn't me that said that. It was the author of Hebrews that said that. Um, what more do you want me to say? Faith can operate in the life of any person. Faith can operate in the life of any person who dares to listen to God's word and surrender to God's will. Remember our definition of true biblical faith. True biblical faith is confident obedience to God's word in spite of circumstances and the consequences. That's what true biblical faith is. And we looked at a variety of different people throughout chapter 11 who have demonstrated faith in God. Right? We took them one by one, and we went through the whole list. Now the writer of Hebrews is saying this in verse 32, what more do you want me to say? What more do you want me to say? He had given us a list of imposing, or imposing list of, of men and women of the Old Testament who demonstrated faith and endurance. He gave us a whole list of that. We started and we started to look at, at uh, Abel, and then we looked at Enoch, and Noah, and Moses, and Abraham, and the list went on and on and on. And we finished last week looking at Rahab. So he gives us this list of men and women who demonstrated faith and endurance. So he's more or less saying this, how many more examples do I have to give you to make this point? That it's impossible to please God without faith. That's what we see in verse 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. And then he gave the list, and he's saying, how many more examples do I have to make in order to get this point across? It's not like he ran out of examples, right? He probably could have kept on going, and he sort of does. He didn't run out of examples, but this is what he ran out of. He ran out of time. He ran out of time. It would take a lot more time to go in detail with every other person of faith in the Old Testament. It would take a lot of time. So he was running out of time, not examples. He had many more people to talk about who had triumphs, and he had many more people to talk about who had testings of their faith, so what I'm going to do this morning is try to do what he did and wrap up this study on the faith of these people. Look at verse 32. <coughs> Excuse me. And what shall I more say? For the time would fall me to tell of Gideon, of Barak, of Samson, of Jethe, of David also, and Samuel, and of the prophets. So he's saying, hey, I could talk a whole lot more about people, but for time's sake, we can't do that. So let's just look a little bit at the stories of these people that he mentioned. Gideon. You remember Gideon? At first, he was that frightened farmer. Right? He was thrashing his wheat undercover. He was afraid. His faith wasn't strong right from the beginning. And then when we read through his story, which is in Judges chapter 6 and 7, we see that things changed. His faith grew. We see that he had a, an army that was reduced from 32,000 men down to 300. Can you imagine? You'd probably feel pretty confident with 32,000 men behind you. 
But then the Lord dwindled that down to 300. For those that don't know, 300 is less than 32,000. Just a little bit. First, the timid were sent home. Then those who thought too much of their own comfort. And then with this hardcore group of 300, Gideon won the battle against the Midianites. Isn't that awesome? Did he do that in his own strength? Oh, no. He had complete confidence in God. Complete confidence. Then there was Barak. Ever hear of him? Or do you know much about him? Here's a little brief highlight of him. When called to lead Israel to battle against the Canaanites, he agreed. But there was a condition. Deborah would have to go with him. The prophetess Deborah. She would have to go. In spite of this which the world will call cowardly faucet in his character, God saw real trust in this guy. And he lists him among the list of men of faith. That's awesome, isn't it? Again, what I love about this chapter is God doesn't list all their flaws and mess-ups. He just says, by faith... This guy did this, or this woman did that. By faith, by faith. We see that phrase over and over. So both Gideon and Barak are encouragements to us. Well, how are they encouragements to us? They are encouragement to us who falter in our faith. Sometimes we're not as faithful as we ought to be. I'm not. But praise the Lord, he's always faithful. His faithfulness doesn't count on my faithfulness to him. So these two guys should be an encouragement to us when we falter in our faith. Then we have Samson. Samson. He was another man of obvious weakness, wasn't he? Yet in spite of that... God detected the faith that he had. The faith that enabled him to kill a young lion with his hands. To destroy 30 Philistines in Ashkelon. To slay a thousand Philistines with the the jawbone of a donkey. To carry away the gates of Gaza. And finally pull down the temple of Dagon and slay more Philistines in his death than he did when he was alive. Do you feel sorry for Dagon? Do you remember Dagon? He was tipped over a couple times. The poor little god. His arms and his head were cut off. And now his whole temple is left in ruins. Don't feel sorry for him because he's not a real God. There's only one God, and that's the God that we love and serve, the God of the Bible. Would we call Samson a godly man? Probably we would say, "Mm." he yielded to his fleshly appetites. He was a Nazarite which means he was dedicated to the Lord at birth. He messed up in life over and over again. But God is a God of second chances and third chances and more if needed. Samson did trust God. Samson did ask help for help. And he was delivered in the end. Samson was willing to give his life to defeat the enemies. However, we must understand something here. 
we must not conclude that we as believers today can live a double life or live both sides of the fence and still enjoy God's blessings because we can't, right? We can't have a, a foot in Christianity and a foot in the world and expect, expect God to bless us the way he wants to. It can't happen. I remember saying to someone one day, or he said to me actually, why isn't God blessing me anymore? And I said, well, when you turn your back on God, he doesn't bless you the, the way he wants to. And then that person said something to me, which I won't say. But it's true, though. You can't have your foot in the world and with God and expect to be blessed when you're mingling with the world. We're told in the New Testament to separate ourselves, to be separate from the world. <clears throat> Let's move on to our next character here, which is Jephthah. He was an Ill illegitimate child, but yet he rose to be the deliverer of his people from the Amorites. What truth can we get from him? He il illustrates this truth, that faith enables a person to rise above his birth and environment and make history for God. He illustrates that you can rise above your birth and your environment and do great things for God. That's what he pictures. We hear people all the time. Well, my life is in shambles because of what my parents did when I was a child, blah, blah, blah. You're an adult now. You're responsible for your own decisions in your own life. Here's truth. Faith can enable us to rise above our birth, rise above the environment that we grew up in, so that we can do great things for God. That's what faith does. Faith is amazing, isn't it? It's amazing. This was also the guy that made the vow when he came home, on his way home. The first thing that I see when I go through that gate, I'm going to sacrifice to the Lord. Because back in the day, usually it was your farm animals that were out in front of your house. But on that day, for some reason, it was his daughter that came through first. So then he was in a conundrum. He made the vow that I'm going to sacrifice to the Lord. And I believe he kept that. I don't believe that he killed his daughter, but I believe he offered her to the Lord in the virgin state that she was, dedicated her to the Lord for the rest of her life. But faith can change a person. And then we see here he goes on and says, of David also. So I could spend a lot of time talking about David, couldn't I? Um, when we were away, I listened to David Jeremiah a little bit when I could catch him. And he spent two weeks talking about the life of David. I'm not going to spend two weeks talking about the life of David. I'm not even going to spend ten minutes talking about David. I'm just going to highlight a few things that we know about David. David shines first in his contest with Goliath. Remember Goliath? David went in the strength of the Lord. Then we see his noble behavior when it came to Saul. Then you could read of his capture of Zion and his countless other episodes. But then we could also read of his mess-ups. And I think one of the biggest mess-ups would be Bathsheba. Right? She was out in the evening taking a bath, which was probably a common thing for her. And David was on his roof, just walking around, and she caught his eye. I heard people say, why would she be out taking a bath? Well, you've got to know a little bit about the, the history and the culture back then. Most buildings were all the same height, and they had a little bit of walls, privacy walls going up, so she could be in the bath and nobody could see her. But the only place that was higher than the houses was the kingdom. 
And in reality, David shouldn't even have been there. David should have been over war where he should have been. But for some reason, he decided, no, I'm going to stay home and let the guys handle this one. So we see he sees Bathsheba. Then he sends a servant to call Bathsheba. Bathsheba comes, he lays with her, gets her pregnant. Now we have a whole other dilemma because she was married. Oh, no problem. I'll call Uriah the Hittite home to get a report. And then I'll say, good job, go home and spend time with your wife. But he was a man of valor. He's like, no, I'm not going to go home and be with my wife when everyone else is on the field. So he slept with the servants. So David said, okay, let's get him drunk, and maybe he'll get so drunk that he will go home. But no, he didn't. So then David had to continue on and say, okay, i got to do something here. Oh, yes, let's send a letter with him. His death letter. He was murdered in the field, more or less, by David. But then it all came back. But you notice, at the end of it all, after his repentance, because we see in the book of Psalms, he repented a lot. We see that he is known as the man after God's own heart. A friend of God. In Psalms, we find his faith crystallized in penance, praise, and prophecy. Then he concludes, the writer of Hebrews concludes with Samuel. Samuel was the last of Israel's judges and the first of her prophets. He was God's man for the nation at the time where the priesthood was marked with spiritual bankruptcy. The priesthood was in shambles. He was probably the greatest leader in Israel's history. It's impossible for us to examine each example of faith. And the writer stops giving names after David and Samuel, who were certainly great men of faith. But now he moves on and looks at a different side of faith. Look at 33 to 35. Who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their, their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. They went through a lot of stuff, didn't they? David subdued kingdoms and wrought righteousness. Daniel's faith stopped the mouths of lions in Daniel chapter 6. Three Hebrew men known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego overcame the power of fiery furnace. We see that in Daniel 3. It says they escaped the edge of the sword. David escaped Saul's sword, did he not? Over and over again. Elijah escaped Jezebel's attacks. And Elijah, or Elisha, escaped from the kingdom of Syria. We see many became valiant in battle. Faith endued men with strength beyond their natural ability. It enabled them to overcome in the face of insurmountable odds. Then in verse 35, we have women that are mentioned that, that had children raised from the dead. And we see two stories of this. One is in 1 Kings 17, and that was the, the widow of Zarephath. And in 2 Kings 4, the woman of Shenem. So a lot of different persecutions and, and, and struggles going on because of these people and their faith. And in addition to that, people performed dazzling feats. 
They endured intense suffering for God. And God values both everything done by faith and the suffering by faith. Again, I encourage you to read this book, Fox's Book of Martyrs. I know I mentioned this before, and some people said, oh, I can't read that. I read some of it before, and it's just too gory. But it's telling you what people went through for God, how they died for God. They wouldn't denounce the name of God. Because of their faith, some were subjected to cruel torture. In that book, it talks about some who were tied to horses and they were drugged through town. Some who were um, burned alive in oil. Uh, Nero took Christians and used them as live uh, candlesticks in his, his garden. Right? This is torture that was going on. If they would renounce the name of Jehovah they would have been released. But it says here, they wouldn't. They would rather die for him and be raised in a better resurrection. They would rather die for him and give glory to him instead of being counted a traitor of God for the rest of their lives. They endured all these things. They endured all these things. Verse 36 tells us, others were mocked and flogged and were bound in prison for their faithfulness to God. Today, as Christians, we get all upset and flustered if we say, can I tell you about Jesus? And the person says, no. We don't endure any of this stuff, do we? We don't. But one day that might all change. I believe persecution is coming. Just by watching the world and seeing what's going on, persecution is coming. We have been so blessed in North America. Almost blessed too much where we're comfortable. But persecution is coming. Jeremiah, he endured all the forms of punishment he was mocked, flogged, bound in prison, apparently. Joseph, he was in prison because he would rather stand for God than sin. Remember the lady that tried to get him? He fled and left his coat. And then she made the false accusation and he was in prison. He would rather go to prison than sin against God. They were stoned. Anybody comes to mind? Stephen, right? He's a New Testament character. Others were stoned. They were so, sawn in two. Apparently that's how I, um, Isaiah died. He was cut in two. They were slain with the sword. They suffered poverty. They suffered persecution. The world treated them as they were not worthy to live. Oh, all these people that believe in God and everything else, they're no good for nothing. They're so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. We hear that. The world treated them as they were not worthy to live. But the Spirit of God bursts forth here and he says, no, it is the opposite. It's the other way around. The world is not worthy of them is what it says. Verse 38, of whom the world was not worthy. Man's estimation of these people of faith was very low. Very low. So that's why they persecuted them. That's why they arrested them. That's why they tortured them. That's why in lots of cases they were put to death. But God's estimate of these people is totally different. And praise God for that, yes? His estimation of us is totally different than what the world thinks. In reality, it doesn't matter what the world thinks. All that matters is what God thinks. And he says the world is not worthy of these people. The Apostle Paul is a good illustration of this, isn't he? He's a good illustration. 
Festus said that, that Paul was out of his mind. Anybody ever say that to you? Oh, you're following Jesus. You're out of your mind. The Jews said that he was not fit to live. We see that in Acts 22, verse 22. Paul, you're not fit to live. In 1 Corinthians 4.13, Paul himself was treated like the filth of the world, the offscuring of all things. That's according to the world. You're not fit to live. You're nothing but the filth of this world, Paul. Yet Paul was God's chosen vessel. Probably the greatest Christian that ever lived. Think of this. We too are God's chosen vessel. We're special in God's eyes. He made us the exact way that he wanted us. He does not make mistakes. He values us. Faith enables us to turn from the approval of the world and only seek the approval of God. That's what faith does. I don't care what the world thinks of me. I only care what God thinks of me. And really, that's the only opinion that matters, isn't it? That's what faith does. If God is glorified in delivering his people, he will do it. He delivered some from all this stuff. So if he's glorified by delivering his people, he will do it. If he sees fit to be glorified by not delivering his people, then he'll do that. Because God is God and he's in control and he's sovereign and he does what he wants. And what he does is always right. But we must never conclude that the absence of deliverance means a lack of faith on the part of God's people. We must never conclude, well, I'm going through this trial and God's not delivering me from it, so there must be something wrong with my faith. Don't think that. God's glorified whether he delivers us from persecution or not. And it's his choice. Faith also looks to the future. For that is where the great rewards are found. Isn't that true? Are we looking to the future? Are we looking for his return? He's coming again. And probably sooner than we think. Are we looking forward to going home? Are we looking forward to our inheritance in heaven that will never rust, that will never decay? Are we looking forward to that? The people named in this chapter, and even some that weren't named, did not receive the promises. But they had, they had God's witness of their faith. And one day, that will be rewarded. They will be rewarded. God's purpose involves Old Testament and New Testament saints. One day, all of us will share that heavenly home. We will share it together because we look for it by faith. We look for it by faith. Again, I've mentioned this before. There are preachers out there that tell us the Old Testament is irrelevant. Some actually go as far as saying anything before the resurrection is irrelevant. We don't have to study it. We don't have to know it because it doesn't matter. I say that they are dead wrong. 
because the Bible says that these things are here for our learning. So Andy, Stanley, and all those guys are wrong. So we today, as New Testament saints, should be thankful for these Old Testament saints. For they were faithful during difficult times. And we can follow their examples. That's why they're here. And we too can live by faith. If we were to continue this chapter, would we put ourselves in it? By faith, so and so did this for God. By faith, the people at Salem Baptist Church they confidently obeyed God's word in spite of consequences and circumstances. I trust that if this chapter was to be added to, which it's not, that that's what it would say. That those people had true biblical faith. Yes, they messed up at times, even their pastor. But by faith, they believed God. By faith, they did wonderful things by God. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Without faith, it is difficult to please him. That's true, isn't it? No. By faith, it's not difficult. By faith, it's impossible to please God. Impossible. But this kind of faith grows as we listen to his word, as we fellowship together in worship and prayer. This faith grows. And here's the exciting thing. Faith is possible for all kinds of believers in all kinds of situations. It's not a luxury just for, you know, those elite saints. It's necessary for all of God's people. It's necessary that we all, as God's people, have true biblical faith. Confident obedience in God's word in spite of circumstances and in spite of consequences. Lord increase our faith. Let's pray. Father in heaven, again, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for Hebrews chapter 11. I know we spent a lot of time in it, but there was a lot for us to look at, to be encouraged by. And Lord, we thank you that faith is possible for all of us. Maybe we have a little faith, May we have a lot of faith. It doesn't matter the amount of faith. What matters is where our faith is in. And our faith is in you. So we just ask that you would use us. That we would obey your word. Confidently obey your word. In spite of what the circumstances are in spite of the consequences. We might lose friends, we might lose family, we might have persecution come our way, but may we obey you in your word. So as we leave this place this morning, thank you for allowing us to come together. Thank you for encouraging us through the songs we sang and through your word. And now as we leave this place, help us to live the way that brings honor and glory to you. That's what we want to do because we love you. So we thank you for all these things and we thank you for the, the precious promises that you make to us. And one of those is one day we will be home with you in heaven for all eternity. What a day that will be. So just go with us as we leave this place. Bring us back next time we meet together so we can honor you and glorify you again. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing our love. I'm not sure what the number is. 
727.